Johnny Mac with your daily comedy news. Seth Meyers is fed up with Donald Trump giving the Taliban credit for stuff. He said, you don't have to give the Taliban credit for anything. They're the Taliban. It's especially insane to call them good negotiators like they're trying to talk down a used car salesman. Does Trump think that if he's nice to the Taliban, they'll hang out with him? Great fighters, great negotiators, and great, great golfers. I mean, thank God this idiot wasn't the chief of police in San Francisco during the Zodiac killings. Bad guy, nasty guy, but you gotta give him credit for one thing. Beautiful, beautiful penmanship. My voice is giving out. I may have recorded three days in a row, to be honest. Brian Baumgartner is out talking about his new milk campaign, cancel culture, and Dunder Mifflin. His book, Welcome to Dunder Mifflin, The Ultimate Oral History of the Office. The mystery isn't who killed it or who disappeared, but what happened? This from The Hollywood Reporter. Brian Baumgartner loves milk. So when the office star was approached by the California Milk Processor Board to front its latest campaign, never do what you love, it was an easy yes. The campaign centers around Baumgartner as he interviews Californians and asks them to defend what they love while hinting at cancel culture and misinformation. Brian, why did you say yes to this campaign? He said, it's a brilliant positioning of an amazing message. First of all, the California Milk Processor Board and their iconic campaign, Got Milk, I mean, who doesn't know Got Milk with the mustaches? My first thought was, am I going to have a mustache? I, I can only read this as him doing Kevin, and I know he doesn't sound like that in real life, but as I'm reading this, I'm just hearing Kevin, and I don't do a Kevin impression, but let me read the words again. Who doesn't know Got Milk with the mustaches? My first thought was, am I going to have a mustache? Now do that in your own head, Kevin, and it's pretty funny. Because I don't do the facial hair with Never Doubt What You Love campaign. It's a play on combating all the misinformation that exists in the world. You never quite know what's good, what's bad. And so we use that as a play on milk and encourage people to never doubt those things that they love, like milk. (laughs) In the campaign, we have a lot of fun canceling puppies and grandmas and beaches and all things people love in California. I had a lot of fun shooting it and I got to meet a lot of interesting people. I am a milk drinker. Yes, whole milk, 2% non-fat, depending on what I'm putting it in. It was easy for me to support them because I truly do love milk. The Hollywood Reporter asked Brian, what are some things that you love? Brian said, "I'm so it's so hard for me. I'm picturing his face and I want to call the man Kevin. It's not like I'm looking at a picture of him. I'm just looking at text, but my brain keeps going, Kevin. It's a COVID cliche, but I got a dog during the last year and a half. I never thought I would do the big dog thing in California, but the amount of joy the dog has brought to my life over the last year is indescribable. I'm just picturing Kevin giggling and going, I got a dog. I also think the importance of family and keeping in touch has been a big thing for me. I didn't see my parents for 16 months. They live in the southeastern U.S., and it was really difficult to be apart for so long. I eventually traveled back to spend time with them, but I feel encouraged that new technology was used for good during this bad time. I also used Zoom to stay in touch with old friends from high school. Obviously, in-person stuff is better, but what a great way to reconnect. The Hollywood Reporter did not let go. They want to know about the dog, and they said, That's so exciting about the dog. What's the dog's name and what breed? Brian Kevin said, Meadow, and she's a chocolate lab. She's a big girl now, about 90 pounds and just over a year old. The Hollywood Reporter said, you juggle a lot of projects about The Office with the podcast and a new book. Did you keep a good journal during your time on the show? How do you keep all the stories straight? Brian said, the business of TV was always interesting to me. I was a theater actor before I moved over to film and TV, but I was always interested in how shows were put together, how writers came up with stories. And just all the how and why of it. When I started the journey on the podcast and now the book, book plug, I'll give you one. Welcome to Dunder Mifflin. Everything has been based on the question, why is this so popular? What is it about the show that has made it number one for years, even eight years after we stopped filming? I approached it like a true crime podcast. The mystery isn't who was killed or disappeared, but what happened on the show? I really wanted to go back and look at casting choices, aesthetic choices, cameras, characters, writers, how the show has constructed the ultra-realism, why it remains so popular and still finds new and younger viewers. We've got over 100 hours of recorded interviews completed for the book, and we'll be publishing exclusive, never-before-seen photos. I'm super excited about it. For me, it's been an exploration. I took some notes along the way, but I guess my memory is better than some people would guess. Hmm? From CBR.com, after suiting up as Peacemaker for the Suicide Squad. Did you see the Suicide Squad? It's really good. Watch the Suicide Squad, HBO Max. John Cena has a new movie on Hulu. He plays the wild card Ron in Vacation Friends. The comedy film centers on two couples who couldn't be more different, while Ron and Kyla throw caution and cocaine to the wind. Marcus and Emily perform a more cautious approach to their vacation. However, due to a funny twist of fate, the two couples end up vacationing together in Mexico and hilarious hijinks ensue once drinks start flowing. However, 
What happens on vacation won't stay with Marcus and Emily's vacation and see who comes back to haunt them on the eve of their wedding night. Wow. What appealed to John Cena initially about Vacation Friends was how it was rooted in a realistic situation with wild results. John Cena said any great comedy takes relatable situations and completely makes them hysterically absurd. What drew me to the script is it felt like this is right where I am at this point in my life. Wait, so you're in Mexico doing coke with another couple? Or am I misunderstanding? Oh no, he said more. It was like, well, I'm really kind of focusing on trying to be present, trying to be emotionally more available, trying to really solidify my attachments in life. So I love that. And then the hysterical absurdity stuff, that was fun in its own right. Today's Daily Comedy News is brought to you by Palace Intrigue. That is the show I write for. We do five, six minutes a day about the British royal family. You know the drill. Everybody's mad at Meghan and Harry. Everybody loves the Queen. Everybody loves Kate. Everybody's like, William, he's all right. Nobody likes Charles. Now there's like Diana stuff. The crown's going to come back out. I'm telling you as the writer, there is always royal family gossip, palace intrigue, wherever you get your shows. Short old reviewed another Edinburgh fringe comedy show. This one, Paul Black's Worst Case Scenario. Chortle writes, when social media figures move into the stand-up space, they have a dynamic you don't find in most shows, even before the act walks on stage. There's an established connection between performer and audience that feels intimate and that few conventional comedians could hope to match. But it also means an outsider not fully up to speed, such as, oh, I don't know, let's say a reviewer for a comedy website, can feel excluded from all the familiarity and in-jokes that the performer doesn't need to contextualize. That's the case with Paul Black's Edinburgh debut, a moderately amusing mix of well-delivered stand-up and sketches. Even he concedes that the reactions from the audience are over egg, telling the crowd at one point, thank you for clapping and effing everything. Not many comics would open their show by thanking the brewery company that sponsors them and the designers of the merchandise available in the bar later, by the way. But merch is what this crowd want, flocking to the post-show meet and greet. The 24-year-old speaks of how his TikToks... <sighs> you guys know how I feel about TikTok comedians. ...have given him a very localized level of fame in his native Glasgow. Though it's clearly spread down the M8, still he toils at a day job as a runner on TV and film productions, which informs some of his stand-up from describing encounters with stars or how a boss's veneer at being a right-on maverick has made her no less ruthless than any other corporate shark. The best segments usually revolve around class, his vivid description of a born-again Christian church whose congregation is a mix of the well-meaning middle class and the rough schemes they see as a project as a delight, especially when the story turns to one of the ministers being put on trial for adultery. His popular hipster alter ego, the musician Ghost Boy, feeds into this, and in one sketch they move into the neglected Drum Chapel area of Glasgow, amusingly mispronounced, probably by me too, in search of authenticity. Pulp might have expressed the class tourism idea more succinctly, but Black's brother Mark, a regular collaborator, cuts a fine figure as a cigarette-smoking mum in her dressing gown, sharing the secrets of her people, another character familiar to fans. Worst case scenario, probably doesn't do enough to propel Black out of his bubble of local and internet fame, though it's expanding so quickly, he might not need to. And from the Global Times, famous Chinese stand-up comedian fined for vulgar women's underwear ad, don't act like you're not intrigued, China's most well-known stand-up comedian, come on, you know who this is, Lee Dan, of course, was fined more than 870,000, um, how do you say the Chinese currency? Yuan? Yuan? I don't know. That much. Translated to dollars, $134,347. Anyway, that's the fine for an ad for women's underwear that was insulting to women, thus violating China's advertising law, that according to Beijing authorities. The official WeChat account of the Administration for Market Regulation in Beijing's Haidan District, the ad was discriminatory towards working women and was vulgar and insulting to women's dignity. Sidebar here. Anytime I talk about um, some types of countries, I see the numbers go up. I wonder if I will get a lot of downloads from China. According to media reports, on February 24th, China's most well-known stand-up comedian, Li Dan, published a video on his account on China's Twitter-like Sina Weibo for Beijing-based underwear brand Ubras, in which he said that underwear is equipment that can help women win by lying at the workplace. Later that day, Lee and the brand pulled the ad and apologized on the Twitter-like website, saying the promotion was indeed improper and I should have expected the impact it would have. Many Chinese netizens expressed their support for the fine, criticizing China's most well-known stand-up comedian Lee Dan for using vulgarity as humor they say entertainers should take responsibility for their behavior. This punishment is a warning for them. 
I'm going to keep an eye on my international downloads over the next 24 hours. That is your comedy news for today. Download this show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your shows. See you then.